Okay. Uh, hi. Welcome to I Shoot Watches. Um, this is kind of like a separate little video. I'm going to try to sneak it in. Um, it, it's, it's basically a 10 minute clip of Nicholas Hayek, the, the founder of the Swatch Group, um, talking in the 1990s, I think, uh, about the formation of the Swatch Group and, and his kind of business philosophy. And um, because of the GG and um, this this PDF and everything and, and the kind of I've, I've brought Nicholas Hayek into the story of the GG, the gold watch that I found. Um, if anybody's following that, I think you might be also interested to to hear a little bit about who Nicholas Hayek was from in his own uh, words. But um, the the main thing about him for me is that the, the the Swiss watch industry was going through this quartz crisis in the 80s. He was brought in as a consultant, engineering consultant to to um, help the banks figure out what to do uh, with these. SSIH was kind of in very bad financial c condition. ASUAG was maybe less bad, but also having troubles. And um, he came up with this plan to, to merge them and to make the swatch. And it's it. I've read a lot of the history, and there's some debate about if if he and um, Tomke, the 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 manager of ETA at the time, if they if they actually anticipated how successful the swatch would be. But um, it was certainly a great idea coming out of ETA, and it did it was very successful, and I think that um, Hayek saved the reputation of the Swiss for manufacturing, even by making this cheap watch. Because if they hadn't done that, and if Switzerland had stopped or had, yeah, if, if it had kind of failed to make that transition and remain profitable in spite of the quartz crisis, it may have lost its reputation for manufacturing globally, and not only in the, in the watch industry, but in general. So maybe that's pushing the, the, the limits on how important the watch industry is to Switzerland, but I do think it's important. I was in New York in the 80s. I saw the emergence of the Swatch. I could tell that it was a a, a, a culturally important moment, um, not moment, but decades, that it really did succeed in, you know, highlighting Swiss manufacturing. So in this video, um, Hayek is talking about um, the importance of Western countries not becoming too dependent on Asian countries for manufacturing and just outsourcing all their manufacturing there. And I think that today in 2023, that he, Nicholas Hayek passed away in 2010 or 2011, but um, the, his predictions have come true to, to, to such a uh, degree, uh, not exactly predictions, but like he said, it's a mistake to do that. And the Western countries have done that largely. Uh, the U.S. most of all, and now the U.S. is 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 trying to make up for it with all these crazy, like trying to create a war with China basically to slow down China's economic growth. And all they had to do in the first place was have the kind of wisdom that Nicholas Hayek had, and not lose the manufacturing base in the first place. Because having to create World War Three conditions just to get it back is really really stupid. So anyway, I, 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 I think the interview with him is cool. I'm a big fan of Nick Hayek, and, um, and I thought you guys might want to see this. And if you don't, that's totally fine, too. His name is Nick Hayek. He's revered over there the way Iacocca was in the 80s here. He's also a man who's turned around companies. Porsche, the car company, Gaumont, the film conglomerate, the Swiss train line. And a few years ago, the Swiss asked him to please take back the watch market from the Japanese. The Swiss watch market was completely gone in the world. He took it back and in the process did many interesting things. I went to see this fascinating source of business wisdom at his offices in Biel in Switzerland.
Mr. Hayek, you're not only the man who got Swiss trains to run on time because they'd gotten out of that habit, you're not only the man who saved the Swiss watch industry, that's, that's uh, recognized everywhere, uh, against Japanese competition with Swatch, um, but you're also the man who tells Europeans, A, they shouldn't fear uh, Japanese competition and give up, and uh, B, that we're entirely on the wrong track in the West with the way we handle our economy, that we've lost the love of creating wealth and producing goods. Is that a fair assessment? Sure. It's a very fair assessment, and uh, you have been doing it much better than I try to do it with much more words than you're doing. You know, you're saying it's a fact. It's a Western word, including the United States and Canada. We have lost the courage and the guts to overcome obstacles. And what we're trying to do is to make money uh, on Wall Street, or financial uh, money, without creating new products, new wealth without creating new production mm -hmm. uh, companies in our uh, countries, and we're going uh, to Asia to produce. And this is not uh, f for our future, it's very, very bad. And you have, uh, you, you, you kicked away, brushed away a lot of cliches that we, we believe are, are truths. For instance, uh, when you uh, came into the Swiss watch industry, you said, we are gonna produce for less than it costs the Asians to produce. Now, we imagine that's impossible because we have high salaries and so forth, but you actually say we're going to produce at 40% of the cost and put the rest into marketing, and you did it. Sure. It's not impossible. You take Switzerland. It's the highest uh, wage and salary cost country in the world. There is no other country that has the level of our salary, and we still can produce watches, very high quality watches, uh, consumer uh, watches that are at lower production costs than you can make them in Japan or in uh, Hong Kong. And you did it through technology and... Well, we do it uh, through, through using our technology and using our culture. By making uh, in a watch, instead of 150 parts to make a movement, we put 50. For the time being, we created a new way of making higher and better quality watches, automating it, and adding to it our special culture. And we were very successful with it, with it and we had the philosophy never to leave the lower segment of the market with a high volume production yes. to anybody else. We have to keep it in our countries. And that's a mistake that the automotive industry is doing in the United States and in Europe and everywhere else. And that's where the Japanese rightly have uh, found ways to, to go to steamroll practically everybody in this field. You hate the idea, for instance, that the British make Jags and Rolls Royces and only that. And, uh, and you say if they don't start, if, if, if all of us don't start making common products again, we won't even be making the luxury ones. Sure. It's, uh, it's not a question of hating it. I'm, I'm utterly unhappy with it because Great Britain practically has lost the automotive industry. They don't have any British company producing cars in the lower segment, volume cars or the medium segment. They still have Jaguar and uh, Range Rover and Rolls Royce, and I don't know how long they're going to keep having it. They have Japanese and American and European companies producing in Great mm -hmm. Britain, but no British company is producing anymore. And those are tides, according to you, that can be reversed. For instance, there's not a single TV set assembled now in the United States. That's a stunning fact. Um, but you think that uh, it could happen again if the U.S. had the will? Yes, but not if the U.S. has the will, if the entrepreneur that exists in the United States take over and do it again, and not only financial people. If you don't calculate every three months how much money did I make and you want to have a growth in your profit every three months, if you can just operate like entrepreneurs do, with creativity, fantasy, uh, developing new products, and having confidence in yourself. We are not more stupid than the Japanese. We are not less uh, hardworking than the Japanese. We have proven it for years and generations. I don't know why now. We have to start thinking that everybody else is better than we are. And I wonder what they think of you in Tokyo. You took the watch market back from, away from them, the world watch market. You now dominate in there. What do they think of you? Do you meet them? Oh, sure, I meet them. I have very many visitors coming from Japan, and I think we have mutual respect, and uh, we have mutual contacts, and uh, they respect you. You always respect a fighter that can fight like you do. And you don't have too many respect for people who just give up immediately. And this other idea that uh, we are going towards a service society and all this, all this industrial stuff is greasy and uh, not much fun and uh, doesn't really create wealth, there's another cliche for you. You don't believe that. Well, it's not a question of belief. It's a very dangerous cliche. If you are only a society of services, 
especially if you think about Europe, where we have absolutely no raw material, no, no wealth uh, in, our, in our countries. We have to create wealth. And you create wealth not only with services, because it's very little amount of people who create uh, services and can live up with it. You have to export goods by adding to raw materials that you import special know-how, special more value, added value. And if you don't have this, your, your standard of living will go down. And you cannot live only with uh, services. So, for instance, companies, and I've heard it said from CEO, we shall keep the head office with the brain map, but all the ugly stuff will be done in Mexico and uh, Taiwan and so on. That's, that's the beginning of the end. This is the merchant, Suk, uh, attitude. I buy and sell and make money. Very good. Nothing against it. You can have it. But if you don't produce yourself, you're depending on the people who produce for it. And that's where the wealth is made. They can stop it anytime they want. And the minute we make this for many, many, many years, our people would just forget how we can produce things, and we're not anymore a producing country. We're only a buying country and a selling country. And you have this in many areas of Africa and uh, the Middle East, where the people don't produce too much, but they buy and sell, and uh, we get immediately in trouble. So, for instance, the Swiss, you'd not be content with the Swiss as the bankers of the world, as we imagine them sometimes Oh, to my be. God. We would be a poor Switzerland if we were only the, work, the banker of the world and do nothing else. And this because the banks of Switzerland make more money with the industrial operations that we have here, our own industrial operation, our industrial client who come to Switzerland to mm -hmm. buy and make business with us, our import and export situation, than with all these kings and uh, prime minister from I don't know where who come and put their money, conceal it in Switzerland. It's a very, very small amount of money that cannot help us for uh, this very, very bad development, the development of the last uh, 20, 25 years, the belief of the American and Canadian and Western society that the only target you have in life is to make money and make it no matter how. And forgetting that you have to create things. You have to create industries. You have to create products. Taking junk banks, making big debts, buying company and trying to dismantle them to pay back your debts and whatever is left is your profit. Well, this is not good for the whole country. It might be good for one man, two men, three men to, to amass wealth, but not for the people, not for the country. And uh, we have to think about it, and that's where the entrepreneur is important. The one who literally takes the nothing who, and creates something. The, the guy who creates a new product, a new market, new development, new wealth, new plants, and makes these investments. Is it true that anyone in your company can walk into your office, anyone in Switzerland can pick up the phone and call you? Yes. No interference? No interference. It's the only way I can get uh, ideas, and I have a wealth of, of, uh, of connections and communication with people. I love communicating with people and communicating directly. And one of the big problems I have in this very large corporation that's internationally uh, present everywhere in the world is that I cannot communicate directly, personally, with every one of the 12,000 people working this here. But is it also true that you're ruthless in firing someone or displacing someone who doesn't do the job? Yes, if he is in the management of a company, I am certainly ruthless, which is absolutely not my character. I hate it. But if you're responsible with a very big plane flying over the Alps, and you have a pilot where you realize after giving him three, four, and five time advance notice that he should fly a little higher, otherwise he's going to crash against the mountain, and you have 500 people on that plane, you better get him out and tell him to sit down behind and let somebody else pilot this plane, otherwise you're going to crash altogether. And this kind of responsibility you cannot keep under the name of humanity. You, can, you have to be, to, 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 to be humane for the people working in the company and for your shareholders and for your clients, but not for one managing director. Are you ever scared of failure? You've succeeded brilliantly, but those lonely moments when you're not sure, are you scared? I think every human being has the right to fail. And uh, I have it all. And when I fail, I really uh, love it and try to correct it immediately. And try to find out how can I correct this. And I try to fail not in very important things. But I'm not afraid of failing. Especially when I invest my own personality, my own uh, money, my own everything I have, my own health and wealth. And there I have no fear. But I hate to invest other people's well, in big risks, and I don't do it very often. Nicholas Hayek, thank you so much. I'm sure you've gotten a lot of people thinking. Thank you very much. 
So hopefully that gives you a little bit more context uh, to this discussion about the, uh, the formation of Swatch Group. Thanks for watching.